Hello, and welcome to Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality, the podcast. Written by Eliezer Yudkowsky, read by Ineash Brodsky, based on the works of J.K. Rowling. Second Half of Chapter 72 Self-Actualization, Part 7 Plausible Deniability It was with a subdued mien that seven girls left Madame Pomfrey's office, leaving one of their own behind in a hospital bed. Hannah would be all right in about thirty-five minutes, the healer had said. Torn muscles were easy to mend. Daphne had done all the talking, and according to her, Hannah had suffered a mishap with a road-running charm that had caused the leg cramps. Madame Pomfrey had given them a sharp look but hadn't argued, even though that charm was around six years above their level. Madame Pomfrey had also given Daphne a potion to help with her state of total magical exhaustion, and warned her not to cast any spells for the next three hours. That, supposedly, was from Daphne using up too much magic trying to finite Hannah, rather than the most ancient blade drawing out all of her power to break the protego. The rest of them had decided not to say anything about the bruises under their robes until they could get some older girls to cast a pisky. There were limits to what Daphne could talk around. The whole thing, Susan thought, had been too close. Much too close. If the bully had so much as looked around the corner, if he'd taken a moment to recast his shielding charm... We should stop, said Susan as soon as the seven of them had gotten out of hearing range of the healer's office. We should stop doing this. For some reason, then, even though they were supposed to vote on this sort of thing, everyone turned to look at General Granger. The Sunshine General didn't seem to see them looking at her. She just strode on, gazing off straight ahead. After a while, Hermione Granger said, in a voice that sounded thoughtful and a little sad, Hannah said she didn't want us to stop. I'm not sure it's right for us to be less brave for her than she is. All the other girls, except Susan, nodded at that. I think that's as bad as it gets, said Parvati. And we can handle it. We've proven that now. Susan couldn't think of anything to say to that. She didn't think that shrieking at the top of her lungs about blatant stupidity and doom would be persuasive. And she couldn't just leave the other girls either. Wasn't it enough to be cursed with hard work? Why did Hufflepuffs have to be loyal on top of everything else? By the way, Lavender, said Padma, what in the name of Merlin's underpants were you wearing back there? My hero outfit, said the Gryffindor girl. Daphne sounded weary as she spoke without turning her own head from where she was plodding through the hall. It's the costume of the soldier of Gryffindor from the play Chronicles of the Lunarian Soldiers. Did you transfigure it? said Parvati, looking puzzled. But the bully cast Finate on you. Nope, it's real, Lavender said. See, I just transfigured my hero outfit into a regular shirt and skirt beforehand, so all I had to do was cast Finite on myself after I saw the bully. Do you want your own, Parvati? I got mine made yesterday by Katerina and Joshua in six year for twelve sickles. I think, General Granger said in a careful voice, that would make us all look a little silly. Well, said Lavender, we should vote on whether to... I think, General Granger said, that no matter what anyone votes... I'm not going to be caught dead wearing one of those costumes. Susan ignored the argument. She was trying to think up of some sort of clever strategy for being less doomed. The whole great hall went silent, even if only for a moment, as the seven of them walked into lunch. Then the applause started. It was scattered, not the massive applause of everyone applauding at once. A lot of it came from the Gryffindor table, less from Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw, and none from Slytherin. Daphne felt her face tightening. She'd hoped... Well, maybe after they found a Gryffindor bully to stop and a Slytherin to rescue, her fellow Slytherins would realize. She looked at the Hufflepuff table. Neville Longbottom was applauding with his hands held high above his head, although he wasn't smiling. Maybe he'd heard about Hannah, or maybe he was wondering why Hannah wasn't there. Then, not quite able to help herself, she glanced toward the head table. Professor Sprout's face was lined with concern. She and Professor McGonagall were leaning their heads toward Headmaster Dumbledore, who had a solemn look, and all their lips were moving quickly. 
Professor Flitwick looked more resigned than anything else, and Quirrell, face slack, was taking trembling stabs at a soup using a spoon gripped in a fist. Professor Snape was looking directly at... her? Or at Hermione Granger standing next to her? A small, thin smile crossed the potions master's face, and he raised his hands, brought them together once in a motion that was too slow to be a real clap. And then the potions master turned back to his plate, ignoring the conversations around him. Daphne felt a little chill go down her spine, and she hastily turned to walk toward the Slytherin table. Susan and Lavender and Parvati peeled off from their group, heading toward the Hufflepuff and Gryffindor tables on the other side of the Great Hall. It happened as they were passing the part of the Slytherin table where the Slytherin Quidditch team sat. That was when Hermione stumbled suddenly, stumbled hard like she was being yanked off her feet, and went sprawling into the gap between where Marcus Flint and Lucian Bull sat, and there was a sad little splutching sound as Hermione's face ended up in Flint's plate of steak and mashed potatoes. Everything seemed to happen too quickly then, or maybe it was just Daphne herself who was thinking too slow as Flint let out a bellow of indignation and his hand yanked Hermione back and threw her into the Ravenclaw table, and she bounced off a student's back and collapsed onto the ground. The quiet spread out in ripples. Hermione pushed herself up on her hands, though she didn't get all the way to her feet. Daphne could see that her whole body was shaking and that her face was still covered with mashed potatoes with scattered pieces of steak. For a long moment, nobody spoke. Nobody moved, like nobody in the whole Great Hall could imagine, any more than Daphne could, what happened next. Then Flint's powerful voice, the voice of the Slytherin captain that bellowed commands on the Quidditch pitch, said in a dangerous rumble, You ruined my food, girl. Another moment of frozen silence. Hermione's head, Daphne could see it trembling, turned to look at the Slytherin Quidditch captain. Apologize to me. Harry Potter started to push himself up from the Ravenclaw table and then stopped abruptly, halfway to his feet, as if he'd just thought of something. Then five other people stood up from the Ravenclaw table. All of the Slytherin Quidditch team stood up, their wands coming into their hands, and then students stood up at the Gryffindor table and at the Hufflepuff table, and without thinking Daphne turned to look at the head table and she saw that the headmaster was still sitting down, watching, just watching. Dumbledore was just watching, and he had one hand out as though to restrain Professor McGonagall. In just one second, someone would shout a spell, and then it would be too late. Why wasn't the headmaster doing anything? And a voice said, My apologies. Daphne turned back to look, her mouth gaping open in absolute shock. Scourgeify, said that smooth voice, and the mashed potatoes vanished from Hermione's face, revealing the Ravenclaw's surprised expression as Draco Malfoy approached her, sheathed his wand again, and then knelt to one knee beside her and offered her a hand. Sorry about that, Miss Granger, said Draco Malfoy's polite voice. I guess someone thought they were being funny. Hermione took Draco's hand, and Daphne suddenly realized what was about to happen. But Draco Malfoy didn't raise Hermione halfway up and then drop her. He just pulled her to her feet. Thanks, said Hermione. You're welcome, Draco Malfoy said in a loud voice, not looking to either side to see where all four houses of Hogwarts were staring at him in total shock. Just remember... Being cunning and ambitious doesn't mean you have to be like that. And then Draco Malfoy went back to his seat at the Slytherin bench and sat down like he hadn't. He hadn't just... He'd just... Hermione went to the nearest empty place at the Ravenclaw bench and sat down. A number of other people, rather slowly, sat down. Um, Daphne? Said Tracy. Are you all right? Draco's heart was hammering in his chest so hard he worried it might explode right out of his chest in a shower of blood, like that curse Amicus Caro had used once on a puppy. Draco's face stayed completely controlled, because he knew it had been drilled into him over and over that if he showed the slightest sign of the fear he was feeling, 
his housemates would rip him apart like a swarm of acromantulas. There'd been no time to check with Harry Potter, no time to plot, no time to think. Just the instant of realizing that the time to start rescuing Slytherin's reputation was right then. From all sides of the long Slytherin table, angry faces stared at Draco, but they were outnumbered by the faces that just looked puzzled. All right, I give up, said a sixth-year boy that Draco didn't recognize, sitting across from him and two places to his right. Why did you do that, Malfoy? Although his mouth was very dry, Draco didn't swallow. That would have been a sign of fear. Instead, he took a bite of carrots, which had the most moisture of anything on his plate, and chewed and swallowed, thinking as rapidly as he could. You know, Draco said, making his voice as cutting as he could, as his heart thumped even harder in his chest as everyone around him stopped talking to listen. There's probably some way to make Slytherin look even worse than attacking eight first-year girls from all four houses who are working together to stop bullies. But I can't think of how. This way, we get the benefit of what Greengrass is doing. The puzzled faces stayed puzzled. What? said the sixth-year boy, and... Wait, what benefit? said a fifth-year girl, sitting to his right. It makes Slytherin House look better. The Slytherins around him were giving him quizzical gazes like he'd just tried to explain algebra. Look better to who? said the sixth-year boy. But you just helped a mudblood, said the fifth-year girl. How's that supposed to look good? Draco's throat closed up. His brain was experiencing a hideous malfunction during which it couldn't think of anything to say except the truth. Then... It's probably some kind of tremendously clever scheme Malfoy's got going, said a fifth-year boy. You know, like in the tragedy of light, where everything that looks like a setback is part of the plot, and it ends with Granger's head on a stick, and nobody suspecting that it was him. That makes sense, someone said from further down the table, and there was a lot of nodding. Do you know what the boss is up to? Vincent muttered in an undertone. Gregory Goyle didn't reply. In his mind, he could hear very clearly his master's voice saying, I can't believe I believed every word of that. The day the rumor had started about Salazar Slytherin showing Potter and Granger where to find bullies. Mr. Goyle, whispered Vincent. Gregory Goyle's lips shaped the words, Oh, no. But no sound came out. Hermione had left lunch early that day. For some reason, she hadn't felt hungry. Those few seconds of horrible humiliation had kept burning through her mind. Over and over, the feeling of her face squished into the mashed potatoes and then being thrown through the air, and then the Slytherin boy's voice saying, Apologize to me. It might have been the first time in her whole life that she'd felt like hating someone. The boy who'd thrown her... Marcus Flint, they'd said his name was, and whoever had cast the tripping jinx on her in the first place, she'd felt it. For one horrible instant, she'd wanted to go tell Harry that if he started getting creative on her behalf, she wouldn't object. She hadn't been a minute out of the Great Hall before she'd heard the sound of running feet behind her and turned to see Daphne racing toward her and listened to what her sunshine soldier had to say. Don't you understand? Daphne's voice was barely below a shriek. Just because someone's nice to you doesn't mean they're your friend. He's Draco Malfoy. His father is a Death Eater. All the parents of all his friends are Death Eaters. Not Goyle, Crab, everyone around him. Do you get it? They all despise Muggleborns. They want everyone like you to die. They think you're good for nothing but being a sacrifice in horrible dark ritual. Draco is the next Lord Malfoy. He's been raised from birth to hate you and he's been raised from birth to lie. Daphne's gray-green eyes stared fiercely at her, demanding assent and understanding. He... Hermione said falteringly. She remembered the rooftop, the awful jolt as she started to fall. 
Draco Malfoy's hand grabbing hers and holding it so hard that she'd had bruises afterward. She'd had to tell him twice before he finally let her fall. Maybe Draco Malfoy isn't like them. Daphne's whisper was almost a scream. If he doesn't end up doing you ten times as hard as he just helped you, his life is over. Do you understand? I mean, Lucius Malfoy would literally disinherit him. Do you know what the chances that he's not up to something? Tiny, said Hermione in a small voice. Zero, hissed Daphne. I mean, none. I mean, less than zero. I mean, the chance is so small you couldn't find it with three magnifying charms and a point me spell and, and, and an ancient map and a centaur prophet. Everyone in Slytherin knows he's planning to do something to you and doesn't want to be suspected. I heard someone say he's been pointing his wand at you just before you tripped. Don't you see? This is all part of Malfoy's plan. Draco sat, eating his steak with roasted cauliflower florets and ashwinder sauce. It wasn't made from real ashwinder eggs, it just tasted like fire. Trying not to laugh, and trying not to cry. He'd heard about plausible deniability, but hadn't really realized how much it mattered until he found that Malfoy's didn't have any. You want to know my plot? said Draco. Here's my plot. I'm not going to do anything. And then the next time people think I'm plotting something, they won't be sure. Huh, said the fifth-year boy. I don't think I believe you. That doesn't sound cunning enough to be really it. That's what he wants you to think, said the fifth-year girl. Albus, Minerva said dangerously. Did you plan all this? Well, if I did snap my fingers under the table, I wouldn't just tell you that. The defense professor's quavering hand dropped his spoon into the soup again. What do you mean, set you up? said Millicent. The two of them were sitting cross-legged on Daphne's bed, having come there straight from the great hall after lunch. With my seer's eyes that stare through time itself, I saw you winning. Daphne stared at Millicent, her own merely mortal eyes rather narrowed at the moment. That boy was expecting us. Well, yeah. Everyone knows you're hunting bullies. Hannah got hit by a really painful hex. She had to visit a healer, Millicent. For friends, he should have warned me. Look, Daphne, I told you. The Slytherin girl paused, as if trying to remember something, and then said, I mean, I told you, what I see has to come to pass. If I try to change it, if anyone tries to change it, really terrible, awful, no good, extremely bad things will happen. And then it will come to pass anyway. If I see you getting beaten up, I can't tell you that, because then you try to not go, and then... Millicent stopped. And then? Daphne said skeptically. I mean, what happens if we just don't go? I don't know, but it probably makes being eaten by Letherfalls look like a tea party. Look, even I know that's not how prophecies work. Daphne said, then paused. At least, prophecies don't work like that in plays. Admittedly, there were all sorts of tragedies where trying to avoid a prophecy made it happen. Or where, on the other hand... Trying to go along with a prophecy was the only reason why it happened. But you could make prophecies happen your own way if you were clever enough. Or if someone who loved you enough could take your place. Or with enough effort, it was possible to break a prophecy outright. Then again, in plays, the seers never remembered what they saw either. Millicent must have seen Daphne's hesitation because the other girls started looking a little more confident. Well, this isn't a play. Look, I tell you if I see it being a hard battle or an easy one. But it's all I can do, you understand? And if I say hard, you can't not show up. Or, or... Millicent's eyes rolled back in her head and she intoned hollowly. Those who try to cheat their destinies will come to sad and gloomy ends. Professor Sprout shook her head, her face looking tight. But, said Susan, 
But you helped Harry Potter that one time. And it was made quite clear to me, Professor Sprout said in a voice that sounded like someone was using a shrinking charm to squeeze her throat. That it was Professor Snape's job and not mine to keep order in Slytherin House. Miss Bones, please, you don't have to do this. Yes, I do have to. Susan said unhappily. I'm a Hufflepuff. We have to be loyal. A mysterious parchment under your pillow, said Harry Potter, looking up from where he was sitting, in the quieted nook where they were studying. Then the boy's green eyes narrowed. It wasn't from Santa Claus, was it? Pause. Okay, said Hermione. I'm not going to ask, and you're not going to tell me, and we're both going to pretend that you never said that, and I don't know anything about it. Susan approached the table as soon as the older girl was alone, glancing around the Hufflepuff common room to make sure nobody was watching, the way Auntie had taught her to do it so that it wouldn't be obvious that she was looking. Hey, Susie, said the seventh-year Hufflepuff. Do you already need more? Can I please talk to you privately for a bit? Susan said. Jamie Astorga, seventh year of Slytherin, and until recently considered a promising upstart on the youth dueling circuit, stood ramrod straight in Professor Snape's office, with his teeth clenched tight and sweat trickling down his spine. I distinctly recall, said the head of his house in a sardonic drawl, that I warned you and a number of others this very morning that there were certain first-year girls who might prove annoying if a fighter were incautious and allowed himself to be taken by surprise. Professor Snape stalked in a slow circle around him. I said Jamie as more sweat beaded on his forehead. He knew how ridiculous it sounded, how much of a pathetic excuse. Sir, they shouldn't have been able to. One first-year girl shouldn't have been able to break his protego, no matter what sort of ancient charm she used. Greengrass must have had help. But it was very clear that his head of house wouldn't believe that. Oh, I quite agree, murmured Snape in a low tone, instinct with menace. They shouldn't have. I begin to wonder if Mr. Malfoy, whatever his plotting, has a point. It cannot be good for the repute of Slytherin House if our fighters, rather than demonstrating their strength, lose to little girls. It is well that you had the good taste to be defeated by a little girl, who is a fellow Slytherin of a noble house, a storger, or I would deduct points from you myself. Jamie Astorga's fist clenched at his side, but he couldn't think of a thing to say. It was some time before Jamie Astorga was allowed to leave the presence of his head of house. And afterward, only the walls, the floor, and the ceiling saw Severus Snape smile. That evening, Drake was visited by his father's owl, Tanaxu, who wasn't green, but only because there weren't such things as green owls. The best father had been able to find was an owl of the purest silver feathers, with great luminous green eyes and a beak as sharp and cruel as any snake's fang. The parchment wrapped around Tanaxu's leg was short and to the point. What are you doing, my son? The parchment that Draco sent back was equally short, and it said, I'm trying to stop harm done to Slytherin's reputation, father. In as much time as it took for an owl to fly from Hogwarts to Malfoy Manor and back again, the family owl bore another message to Draco, and this one said only, What are you really doing? Draco stared at the parchment he'd unwrapped from the owl's leg. His hands trembled as he held up the parchment to the light of his fireplace. Five words, carved in black ink, shouldn't have been scarier than death. There wasn't very much time to think. Father knew exactly how long it took for a message to go from Malfoy Manor to Hogwarts and back again. He would know if Draco delayed to compose a careful lie. But Draco still waited until his hand stopped trembling before he wrote his reply, the only answer he'd thought of that Father might accept. I am preparing for the next war. 
Draco wrapped the parchment around the owl's leg and tied it, and then sent Tanaxu winging out of the room, through the halls of Hogwarts, into the night. He waited, but no reply came. End Chapter 72 Thank you to the following people. Severus Snape by Brian Jones Minerva McGonagall, read by Autumn Rachel Dryden Hermione Granger, anonymous Daphne Greengrass, J.C. Cotton Casey Davis was voiced by Luppy Lavender Brown by Paige Smith Hannah Abbott, Mars Padme and Paravati Patil by Amanda Grisello Lauren Housley as Susan Bones Vincent Crabbe by Captain Hatchmo Marcus Flint by Drew Inucci Lucius Malfoy, voiced by Martek Tex. Professor Sprout, by Paula Rizzuto. Millicent Bulstrode, by Gigi Arndt. This chapter's original text, production notes, and attribution links, along with archives and much more, can be found at hpmorpodcast.com. If you would like to learn more about the art of rationality, please visit lesswrong.com, an online community of aspiring rationalists founded by Eliezer Yudkowsky. Some sound effects used are courtesy of the Free Sound Project. The music used is Catch That Goblin by Skaven. Thank you for listening, and come back next week for Chapter 73, Self-Actualization, Part 8, The Sacred and the Mundane.